Hi everyone, I'm Dom Griffin and you're watching the Armchair Auteur. This is an ongoing video series I do where we talk about new movies, old movies, screenplay analysis, television series reviews, that sort of thing. So if you are a movie person, if you like movies and you like movie adjacent popular culture and like to see somebody pick those things apart, you're in the right place and you should consider subscribing. Today I'm reviewing Blue Beetle, the third of four DC Comics adaptations coming out in 2023. It's been an interesting year for the superhero movie genre. We had two modern classics of the form, with James Gunn ending his Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy and the long-awaited sequel to Into the Spider-Verse, Across the Spider-Verse, proving a big critical, commercial, and cultural success. This reviewer has not watched Shazam 2 and thus has no feelings to share about it beyond it looks fine but was probably mid? And then there's The Flash, a movie doomed from the start in development for a decade handed down through three different corporate regimes. A movie whose ambition and failure have become a persistent joke as the Barbie movie, of all things, proved to be Warner Brothers' big hit for the summer in its place. In this climate, expectations couldn't be lower for Blue Beetle, a film initially meant for HBO Max, like its ill-fated sister project Batgirl, but given new life as a theatrical release and the designation as being canon in the new James Gunn DCU. But with positive early reactions from the premiere all having the same tenor as the early buzz for The Flash, is this another snow job, or is Blue Beetle actually any good? Yeah, sorta. Mostly? Look, for the first 20 minutes of this movie, I was actually kind of on the fence. Uh, I went in with pretty low expectations. I'm not a big Blue Beetle fan. I never read many of the Jaime Reyes comics or anything, so I didn't have any kind of like horse in this race, let's say. I just kind of wanted to watch a good movie, God forbid. For the first 20 minutes, I was decidedly on the fence. Before any of the actual superior elements are brought into the story, the first 20, 25 minutes of Blue Beetle uh, looks like a TV pilot for a family drama on Freeform. It has this kind of flatness to it, uh, kind of reminiscent of like a, like a Lifetime movie about horny teenagers, uh, or like a PSA about not doing drugs. And director Angel Manuel Soto is doing this thing, like the J.J. Abrams and Mission Impossible 3 thing, where he's like framing close-ups too close to the face and like it feels, it just feels like it was made for television or to be watched on a laptop. I'm not gonna break down the plot too deeply just because it's pretty standard superhero origin movie stuff. Uh, it kind of is of a, a kinship with like the first Raimi Spider-Man movie in, the, in that it takes a, uh, its time getting you uh, connected to the characters and like his life before getting to the superhero stuff and kind of has the vibe of like a like a soy faceless phase one MCU movie, if that makes sense. I initially thought that spending so much time in the first third with Jaime's family, uh, like his, his actual like supporting cast was like maybe a, a, a mistake because I'm like, we're not gonna see these people for the rest of the movie, you know? But I was super wrong and they're actually like very instrumental to the plot and they uh, play a huge part in like the second and third acts. I just kind of want to get to the superhero stuff because again, I'm not that like connected to these characters in that way. But then I figured out Soto was telling like a very personal and heartfelt story about Jaime and his family and their circumstances. Sholo Maraduena from Cobra Kai is great as Jaime Reyes, a recent college grad who thought he'd be the one to get his family out of poverty, only to discover that life in the economically divided fictional Palmera City is no longer conducive to this dream. A chance encounter with Jenny Cord, daughter of missing billionaire Ted, brings him into contact with an alien scarab her aunt is trying to use to make an army of Omax. Slight diversion about the film's villain. Okay. Susan Sarandon plays Victoria Cord, who is the movie's big bad. Reading the wiki and interviews with her and articles about the movie, it says she's playing uh, Ted Cord's sister and that she's Jenny's aunt. And I just watched the movie the other night and I swear to you all that in the movie it said that she was Ted's mom and that Jenny was her granddaughter. I either this is a weird Berenstain thing and like, you know, like the Mandela effect stuff and like uh, I'm just dumb and I'm wrong and that happens. I'm not I'm my memory is super fallible. But if if you guys see this movie like that's actually what it comes out like if it says that she was like the mom, then that means that at some point in production they changed that and that's like a really weird thing to change because I feel like either version of of it having seen the movie makes equal sense, but it's just odd whatever. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. But look, anyway, you get the deal. The Scarab bonds to him. It gives him superpowers. Uh, Victoria wants to scare it back. Uh, his family's in danger. He has to learn how his powers work. I'm not trying to run over the plot specifics as if they don't matter or claim that they're boring or lame. It's just the actual plot and structure and all this stuff is pretty perfunctory. And it's not what I liked about the movie. I didn't think, I didn't think it was bad. I have nothing bad to say about it. I just mean that, like, that's who cares. What really worked for me here is, like, the general tone and, like, the energy on display. Uh, George Lopez is really good as Jaime's uh, uncle and like everyone else in the family, like like the whole family, it's this giant unit, this little clan, 
all the performers are really good and they create this like very believable and like sincere unit. It's, it's like this very specific story about how his family is like his real strength, not the scarab. And I know that sounds like a, a silly kind of like uh, cringe, naive, whatever thing for a movie, but I happen to be at a screening where I was surrounded by like teenagers who like talked and giggled through all the movie serious moments. So I think maybe some people are going to watch this movie and think that's just cheesy, but I thought it was really affecting. I thought it was really sincere and like earnest and like honest and uh, it really actually like touched me. The entire cast is like really, really good. Uh, like I said, Lopez is great. Everyone on like the good guy side of the movie is very good. I feel like except the actress playing Jenny Cord, she gives off like really strong early Gal Gadot vibes, derogatory. Uh, and, and then uh, Susan Sarandon, I was initially skeptical of her being the villain in this movie, to be quite fair. Uh, Susan Sarandon is a great many things, uh, a very talented actress, an inspiring activist, mommy. But watching the movie, uh, I figured out that the reason her performance is so interesting is that she's 100% doing a feature length impression of Hillary Clinton. I don't know if she's just doing like a rib as like payback for all the like verbal abuse she's received on Twitter over the years for not voting for her back in 2016. Uh, but like some of the hair stuff, some of like the delivery, some of the everything, I was like, she is like pulling from the Hillary bag. And I don't know, I found that very fascinating for this movie. I thought that was like really humorous. So she was kind of a delightful surprise and also just a babe. But the human element about Jaime and his family like really, really rings true. We were kind of cursed with like a series of Spider-Man movies where we don't get to see Spider-Man like actually struggle that much because he's like best friends with like a billionaire. Uh, so like all of the like stuff we like from Spider-Man stories, like the Jaime Ray has like picked up basically. Uh, this movie actually allows you to see them struggle and deal with like, you know, money issues and stuff before they start palling around with the 1%. It's also clear that Soto had some real ambition in trying to depict Palmera City, a newly created fictional city as like on par with like Metropolis or Gotham or Coast City or Central City or whatever. Uh, but they're just like the budget was not there for it. There are these beautiful ish shots that show the disparity between like the outer skirt edges where all like the poor people in Palmyra City live and this like sci fi mid 2000s Janet Jackson video look of the actual like city itself. And all I kept thinking was, man, if they had like money, if, they, if this had like if they, this had started with real money, this stuff would be like really affecting. As it stands, I was like, well, I know what they're going for, so like I, I can I can accept it. But like, God, when you first go into court industries, it just has this like cheap feeling looking Attack of the Clones-esque vibe that like it just was just a mistake. Also derogatory. But that's because whatever money got infused into this production to make it ready to be a theatrical release was used very judiciously. This is a movie where all of the CG stuff, all the special effects, is good when it needs to be. There's some parts of the movie that look kind of flat and lame, like a TV, like I said, like a TV movie. But when the action goes down, when we see all the stuff with the suit, all that stuff is like pretty polished, feels more complete, like the like like whatever effects house was working on, it got to take their time with it maybe or something. I don't know if it's just like the, the designs are so strong that like you can get away with doing them differently. I don't know the actual details of it. All I'll say is that like that stuff, the sword coming out of my hand, Guyver stuff, all that stuff looks pretty good. None, none of this stuff is like Avatar The Way of Water, okay? I'm not saying that this is like a triumph for for, for visual effects or something. I'm just saying that it doesn't have the weird rubbery physics of the Flash where everything is in like just a nondescript background. There's a couple of little moments in one of the big fights that just looks kind of like every other superhero fight ever. But a lot of the other stuff, a lot of the other actions like pretty considered and it clearly has like character and like perspective and, and like attitude. Soto and cinematographer Powell Porgozelski. Powell Pol Porgozelski. Porgozelski. He's, he's the guy that shot Midsummer. He works with Ari Aster all the time. He's the DP on this. I wrote it in my notes thinking that I, I tried to sound it out. Uh, I, I messed this up. Anyway, they do a really good job together of kind of grounding uh, like this, you know, sci-fi superhero stuff into like something that feels realistic, that feels like a real city, um, but also has like all these interesting uses of color and like pretty good staging, pretty good framing, pretty good camera movement. Like it just feels a little bit more alive uh, than, than what we're used to getting lately. I feel like lately superhero movies for the most part uh, look kind of like dog shit, feel kind of like dog shit. And this movie didn't give me that vibe. Like it felt like, man, they're really pulling this off. It helps that like the score is really good, has like a cool like kind of 80s energy to it. And that the movie has these really, really good needle drops that are all, you know, kind of help it to be like kind of culturally believable. Like I'm surprised that people aren't leaning more into the fact that this is like a Latino superhero movie. Uh, like it actually really feels like an earnest and honest thing made by uh, Latinos, like for Latinos, and like there's a lot of, like you know, I'm not 
that's not I don't have that background. So like I didn't I, I can't like say I relate to it, but like I could I feel like I would if I was, if that makes sense. I don't know. Like it felt authentic. It felt genuinely authentic and not like winking kind of cheap corporate stuff. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like I thought the stuff in the trailer with the abuela and the, the laser Gatling gun was going to be like really cringe and awkward. Uh, but then in the movie, she's just like mowing down private military uh, stooges but while shouting death to the imperialists. So I was like, oh, this movie's like tight. This movie's like tight, tight. Okay. It's strange how it kind of reminds me of the first Ant-Man a little bit with a scrappy up and comer becoming a second or third generation hero after getting mixed up with the love interest daughter of a famous hero who has been missing for years. But while Ant-Man may have this one beat with its comedy and its size changing sequences, Blue Beetle has it beat for heart and themes and ambition. Like this is a movie that has the main villain like stealing resources from like other countries to like make a, a, a giant like military weapon for people and stuff. Uh, and it deals with it, uh, economic inequality in a way that feels believable and not shoehorned in for like social justice clout. Like it just feels like a serious, sweet superhero movie. Like we just see this guy, we, we, we like Sholo, we like Jaime, he's fun. We want to see him do stuff. Uh, we like the people around him. It, it teases a lot of cool stuff for the future with, with, with the, the previous Blue Beetles. It just feels, it just feels kind of right in a way that a lot of superhero movies recently haven't. And I think that's because it exists in this very fortuitous space. It doesn't have the baggage of having to connect to a bunch of other movies because those movies are still being developed. Uh, but it also doesn't have the weird thing that The Flash and later this year Aquaman uh, 2 are going to have where they feel dead and irrelevant because they're not connected to like this mythos. It's one of the only super movies in the recent years to exist like on its own. Like there's references to Batman and Superman and all that stuff, but they never feel weird. You never feel like you're waiting for a cameo. You don't need it. Like the story itself is engrossing enough that you're never wondering about those things. You buy that this is a world that has those other superheroes, but you're not like clamoring for them. And it, it's, I don't know that they're gonna be able to keep this up when they get to, if, if they get a sequel or not. I mean, I hope the movie makes enough money too. Uh, who knows what James Gunn's actual plans are. He's basically said that yes, this takes place in the new world, but it could slot in anywhere. And that's true. Like you could, you could make this be a part of any part of whatever timeline he's developing because it's its own thing. It never references specific uh, events or, or canon type things. It's just, it just, this is the thing in the DCU. And that's like how a lot of smaller C-level, D-level tier superhero comics are. Like you don't have to, you don't have to be in the mix so much. And it's nice that they're not in the mix, actually. Uh, I, I was pleasantly surprised. Like, look, I'm not gonna say it's like the best DC movies since The Dark Knight or whatever the fuck plotted, they always pull out when they wanna sell one of these things. But I, I really enjoyed it. Like, I thought it was really fun. I thought it was, I know people, eh, fun is like a euphemism for not very good. I'm not going to go that far. I think it's like a really strong, like, I don't like star ratings, like three and a half star movie or whatever. But I liked it a lot. Like, I really, really dug it. I feel like if I watched it again, I'd like it even more, which is a little bit weird. Usually that's not how I feel about stuff like that. And yeah, I just, I'm mostly shocked that it didn't suck. I'm mostly shocked that it didn't suck because... Let me tell you, it coulda. It coulda been fucking ass. Anyway, those are my thoughts on Blue Beetle. I think it's good. I think you should see it. I think it's worth seeing. I feel like about halfway through the movie, I was like, this is a movie that's worth waiting for Max. But then as the movie progressed, I was like, no, I think this is something people should see in a theater with a crowd if they can. I, I'm glad I saw it with a crowd. Again, I was surrounded by like teens that don't take the movie going experience very seriously. But when the movie was over, uh, people clapped. I don't think I've been in a screening where people clapped since John Wick 4, so. Take that as you will. Thank you guys for watching my thoughts about Blue Beetle. And if you like this video, you can give it a thumbs up. If you loved it, you can give it, uh, you can like subscribe to me and hit the little bell icon so you get notifications when I put out new videos. Uh, later this week, I'll have a new episode of The Pod, your favorite film critic, the podcast I've been doing on the channel. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to ask me uh, for this week's pod, uh, you can put them below and I'll talk about them on the pod. If you have not been listening to the pod, we're five episodes deep. You should get with it. People seem to really like it. And uh, yeah. But yeah. Also, if you just have any questions about the movie or whatever, you can put those in the comments here and I will respond to them when I have time. So thank you again for watching. I hope everyone's doing well. I'll see you guys in the near future. Bye.